Goldstein on the scene for The Rogers Review, therogersreview.com, and at 96.7 FM WERA Radio Arlington. We are in Washington, D.C. this week for the upcoming film, The Journey, starring Colm Meany and Timothy Spall. And with me to talk about this wonderful, amazing, based on a true story film is director Nick Ham. How are you doing, Nick? Hey, I'm doing good. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. So we heard about the story, but I want to know, how did you find out about the story about the Little Plain journey that happened after the St. Andrews talks? Well, the movie's about this relationship between two people who were political enemies and who essentially, um, for years, were, were kind of intolerant, didn't tolerate each other and eventually formed um, one of the most interesting contemporary political relationships that I, I'd seen, in a, that I'd known about, really. Mm -hmm. And because of that relationship, because of that friendship between the kind of head of the, loosely between the sort of head of the Catholic community or the head of the nationalist community and the head of the Protestant community in Northern Ireland, they achieved peace. And uh, it's not singularly down to those two men, but those two men were both very prominent in making that happen. And people stopped killing each other because of this. And in, in, a, in an interesting way, that relationship, the story of that relationship, needed to be told. So that's what we did in the movie. Well, that's wonderful. How did you come about casting Timothy Spall and Colm Meany as the iconic characters, the iconic players in the games, which was Paisley and McGinnis? Well, McGinnis, uh, Paisley, let's start with Paisley. Paisley said his father, um, extraordinary looking, uh, figure, you know, six foot five, massive, a very big presence, physical presence. So Timothy's five foot eight. That's about my height. Yeah, he's, <laughs> well, but he's, he's a, you know, he's an English actor, he's not Irish, and he kind of morphs into the role and becomes the role in this kind of amazing way. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, you've probably known him from Turner, yep. and he last did a movie here called Denial, and, and so this is his, you know, this is his new movie, really. And he was in Harry Potter. And of course, he was in Harry Potter. So, but he's also very funny in this film. The movie's a funny movie. The movie's like a uh, sort of, a kind of an old-fashioned buddy movie in many respects. Yes, it is. It's a sort of like a, it's a, it's a kind of weird combination of the odd couple in the back of a car. <laughs> so, he was somebody I always wanted to do it. I thought there was very few actors that could ever play this part. But he was somebody I thought was was absolutely had, not only the. You know, you were fascinated by what he was doing as an actor, and you kind of leaned into him. But he could consume that role and make that role his own. And with Colm, he was, you know, obviously an Irish star. Yes. He, he had, you know, he's done a lot of different parts in his life, and he comes from that nationalist community in Ireland. He's part of that. He knew McGuinness, so it seemed the partnership between the two of them was really cool. Now we understand that the um, talks happened during a plane ride, but yet the movie it featured them in a long car ride. How did that open up opportunities to tell the story itself? Well, you obviously the the actual you know the journey that was really there during the peace talks. Mm -hmm. uh, politicians in Northern Ireland from both sides used to sometimes travel together, yeah. which is weird. And it's like you think, okay, well that's odd. These political enemies would sort of both get on a car. Get, or get in, so get in a plane or get on a boat there in order to avoid, I guess, getting shot or whatever, getting blown up by some idiot. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that what's, what became apparent to us, there was one particular journey that happened where they were all sitting around at St. Andrews in Scotland trying to work out with Tony Blair, all of these people, how they were going to basically move, the, move the, the agenda on when it came to peace in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. Paisley had to fly home and in a private jet. They put this on for him to get back, and McGuinness went with him. Mm -hmm. And that's actually real. That actually happened. That was one of the first times they actually talked to each other. Um, what we did is we said, look, the jet's not very cinematic. You can't put an entire movie in a, in a private jet. That's not going to work. Right. But what's interesting is let's put them in the car, and then let's derail the car. Let's like make it longer. Uh, and make it funny, and let's see how we could, that kind of progresses. And speaking of the car, how did you work with both Spall and Meany on the aspect that their body language during this car ride helped tell the story? Like, we have the dialogue, but looking at two different people from two different sides, and their body language, like, I'm mad at him, he's mad at me, they told the story without any words. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, they do have words. Obviously, they, they have a lot of words, but you're right. They're kind of the nuance of their behavior and the nuance of their characters was incredibly well worked out by both actors because that's what you're watching. You're, you know, who looks at who, whether he crosses his leg away from him, whether they touch arms, can I borrow, can you bring the window down? Can I borrow your cell phone? Look, here's the deal. You, the movie's about what happens to two politicians who you strip away all of the artifice of politics. You take away the assistance, the, the Congress, the uh, media, and you say, okay, what happens if two guys in the proximity of you and I, mm -hmm. who hate each other, who hate everything about each other, are forced to share a car ride with each other? Yes. So what happens then is then the nuance of their behavior is what you start to watch. One man starts to engage the other man in a dialogue, but that doesn't work because the guy doesn't want to talk. Right. So you then get into this situation of how do they start to engage. So then we messed around with the car and how the intelligence services would bug the car and then derail the car wow. so that the car was never going to get to its destination in the time that it was supposed to get it because they weren't... If they go too quickly, then there's no reason for you, any of them to talk. Right, and the, pretty much the whole situation would be dead. And the whole situation would have, wouldn't have happened. So what we did is we fictionalized the car, mm -hmm. and we fictionalized the idea that the Secret Service was involved in, in making the car journey much longer than it really was. And, um, you know, it's quite a successful apparatus because it allowed both actors and the writer to then go, you know what? I can tell this story in this scene, I can tell this story in this scene, and it actually just becomes incredibly funny. Speaking of which, at what point did you get um, the screenwriter Colin Bateman to come on board, and what was the, how important was the role to get him to make this film put together, weave together? Well, you, you know, you come up with a mo the idea for a movie like this, and I, I rang Colin, who I'd worked with a little bit before, and I said, look, this is the idea, what do you think? And he really liked the notion of the idea, got it, got it immediately. He then wrote this incredible script, which in many respects is, 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 is a kind of wonderful um, you know, piece of writing, I suppose. In many, so that's how you attract those kind of actors. Actors don't do that kind of stuff unless they really think the script is brilliant. Mm -hmm. So uh, he, he sourced it in a way, and I think it's just such a tribute to to great writing. I think if you want to see great writing and great cinema, then this is a cool movie to go see. Absolutely. Now, you showed this film at the Toronto Film Festival last year. Did you get a chance to show this film to the people of Northern Ireland, and, and what was their reaction? Yeah, I mean, we, we actually opened the film at the Venice Film Festival, which mm -hmm. we did last year, uh, which was fantastic. We played it to a few thousand Italians, which was hilarious and funny. Then we played it in Toronto, which was great. And about a month ago, we opened it in Belfast, and both sides of the community came to that event in Belfast, the premiere in Belfast. Wow. Both um, senior figures from the nationalist side and from the Protestant side came and really, um, really got involved in the picture. That's wonderful. Have you noticed there's a difference of audience reaction between the audience of Europe compared to the audience here in Northern America? I think there's a different reaction in America because it's it, they embrace the movie in a different way. Uh, because they're not so close to the situation, so they can see the artifice or the conceit of the film working. I think the UK was the hardest place to play the movie. The England was particularly hard to play the movie because they too, they often, they're resistant to the idea of the movie in many respects. Um, but in Ireland, it was a really great experience playing the movie, and all across Europe, in fact. It's been a, it was a really interesting time. Wonderful. One last question. This was one of the final performances of actor John Hurt, who passed away not too long ago. How did you get him on board, and what did you think of his performance in the film? Well, he was, he, I knew he was sick. I knew he was, he was basically dying. He had, he had a terrible form of cancer, and he, uh, he wanted to be in the movie. He want, he'd read the film. He wanted to be in the script, and even though there was problems with insuring him as part of that pro process and making the movie, I thought we sort of owed him a debt of honor because he's such an extraordinary actor, has done so many films over the years. And I think that, that in that sense, um, 
you know, if somebody like John Hurt wants to read your lines and come in and do that, you sort of give him the opportunity. So we made it work for him, and he he was just a, a great presence on the set. And uh, you know, God bless him. He's now gone. God bless him indeed. Nick, thank you for a wonderful opportunity, a wonderful film. The Journey comes out in the theaters June 30th here in the D.C. area. Reporting from the Hotel Monaco in Washington, D.C., I'm Dean Rogers. You can listen to this review at therogersreview.com.